Chapter 34 of The Cruise of the Falcon by E. F. Knight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 A Cruise Around the Reconcavo. On returning to Bahia, I carried out a project that had long been on my mind. When I first sailed into this harbor a year back, I was very desirous of undertaking a cruise among the islands and the bays of that beautiful inland sea, the Reconcavo. My poor mate was, of course, very sad on hearing of this plan. What? he said. You are going to take us up these pestilential rivers? We will all die. It was in vain to tell him that malaria was unknown in the breezy neighborhood of the ocean. We procured a pilot, or rather a Portuguese harbor boat man, who said he was a pilot for the rivers, and sailed away before a glorious sea breeze on the 7th of January. As I had already steamed up the rivers Cachoeira and San Amaro a year before, we made for the mouth of the river Guagaripe, which, after these, is the most considerable river flowing into the Gulf of Bahia. First, we steered right across the Reconcavo to the northern extremity of the large island of Itaparica, which supplies the market of Bahia with fruit. This island is famed for its beauty, and indeed, when we approached it, we could not but allow that it well merited its reputation. Gentle hills rise from the shore, covered with a dense, rich vegetation. A tangled forest of cocos, breadfruit trees, mangoes, bananas, jackas, palms, and other trees. These groves are of a delightful fresh green and resound with the songs of birds. Below are beaches of sand lined with mangroves. As the water was deep, we kept close to the little island as we coasted round it. We passed several little villages whose Negro inhabitants devote their time to fishing and whaling. Small whales are common in the Reconcavo, notwithstanding the constant war that is waged upon them. On doubling a point, we opened the capital of the island, the sleepy town of Itaparica, dominated by an old fort. Sailing from here to the mainland, we entered the mouth of the river, and after ascending it until dusk, came to an anchor a mile below the little town of Maragonipina, and there passed a night among the mosquitoes, surrounded by a dense groves, all glittering with myriads of fireflies and noisy with cicadas. On the next morning there was no wind. Therefore, as our pilot told us that we were not far from the city of Nazareth, we determined to leave the vessel at her anchor and row there in the dinghy. On being closely cross-examined as to the exact distance, he informed us that it was about one quarter of the half of a quarter of a league. I suppose he thought this would sound nice and precise to us, but it hardly tallied with his next statement that it would require from an hour to an hour and a half's rowing to reach it. Three rivers met just above our anchorage. Our pilot pointed out one as being the river of Nazareth, so we proceeded to pull up it, taking him with us so that he might set us right in case of our being at a loss at any other point. The river flowed across a muddy plain, but ahead of us, at about the distance of three miles, were wooded hills under which we were led to understand lay Nazareth. But these hills, though but three miles off as the crow flies, were an unconscionable way off by water for this stream wound about in a most irritating fashion, so that we were rowing away from our destination as often as not. We were crossing an utterly deserted country whose scenery was anything but cheerful. On either side of us stretched great mangrove swamps. The black mud bubbled and festered and stunk under the hot sun. And the mangroves themselves, those most repulsive of all the plants that grow, drooped down from half their height in muddy festoons, showing the point to which the sea-tide rose. Over them crawled innumerable crabs, red and blue and yellow and green, the only reptiles that can find a congenial habitat in such a slough. But a mangrove swamp has often been described before, and all who have seen it bear witness to its loathsome ugliness. On and on we rode, and never seemed to get nearer to the hills. Then dark clouds crossed the heavens, and the rain fell, as it can fall in Brazil, drenching us in a moment, of course. This did not improve the aspect of our dismal surroundings. 
At last we did reach the hills and found that the river skirted them. On one side of us now was the swamp, on the other were the fertile but uninhabited heights. The river now wound more than ever, following each irregularity of the hills. We rode on for a considerable time, but no sign of Nazareth, none of the bells and fireworks that announced to one yet afar off the presence of a Brazilian city. We, so cheerful hitherto, began now to wax wrathful, and the pilot, so very confident hitherto, looked puzzled. Are you sure we are right? Certain, in a quarter of an hour we are there, was his constant reply to our often repeated inquiry. But we doubted him, and when at last we saw a little bamboo rancho nestling in a banana grove on the hillside, we shouted loudly, to the evident dislike of our guide, who did not approve of being mistrusted. The negro householder heard us and came out. Ho, oh, Patrice, called to him one of my friends. It is the custom to address every peasant as Patrice hereabout, until you know his real name. Ho, oh, Patrice, how far to Nazareth? To Nazareth, replied the sable one, chuckling. This is not the Nazareth River. What river is it, then? The river Sao Geronimo. The unfortunate pilot, who had already come to the conclusion that the crew of the Falcon were a set of ferocious pirates, turned white on hearing this, and was fain to jump overboard in order to escape our just anger. But, finding that we were not going beyond classical imprecations, he consented to remain with us, and wet, sad, hungry, and thirsty, we rode all the weary miles back to Falcon, which we reached at about 2 p.m. After a meal, we set out again in search of Nazareth. This time we did hit the right river, which did not traverse a mangrove swamp, but flowed over a bed of silver sand across an agreeable and diversified country. Nazareth we found to be a pretty little town, very picturesquely situated on the slopes of a hill. The river is not navigable beyond this. Here it rushes noisily over a rocky bottom and is spanned by a fine bridge. Of course, it was a saint's day, or rather half a dozen saints' day, and the town was en fête. Rockets and crackers fizzed and banged all around us, the bells were ringing, the church was illuminated within and without at sunset, and we witnessed a curious ecclesiastical procession of priests and negro acolytes, certain of whom bore censers and danced in front, revolving with a slow and stately step singing the while quite in the old biblical style. When we had seen enough of all this and had danced at a mulatto ball, we rode back and, at 3 a.m., partook of a digestible supper of cold tin plum pudding and rum. The next day we sailed down the river till we were off the town of Wagaripe, when, the wind failing us, we came to an anchor. This little town is built on the slopes of a hill covered with tropical fruit trees and is dominated by a fine old church. I went on shore with my two friends. It was blazing hot, being but an hour after midday, and all the inhabitants were within enjoying their siesta. We Englishmen were alone abroad. After wandering about for some time, we were passing a large stone house when an upper window of it opened and a man, putting his head out of it, most courteously invited us to come out of the sun and refresh ourselves. Such hospitality to an utter stranger is thoroughly Brazilian. We entered and were received by this kind person in a large room whose windows overlooked a splendid and extensive view, leagues upon leagues of undulating tropic forest land intersected by many winding rivers. Our host produced English bottled beer and cigars and entered into a lively conversation with us with that unaffected cordiality and charm of manner that so distinguishes the gentlemen of this empire. He introduced us to his wife and children and also to his two very pretty and agreeable sisters-in-law. He told us that he was the chief of Huagaripe, which he described as a very quiet, peaceful sort of place. Just below his mansions was a gloomy mass of masonry, a building large enough to lodge all the inhabitants of the town. That, he told us, was the prison. 
But do not, he continued, form an estimate of the number of our criminals from the size of our prison. There are no prisoners in it, and there have not been any for a very long time. Indeed, we have no police here now. There is, indeed, very little crime in Brazil. The mulattoes that form the bulk of the free population are all of an amiable, gentle nature, in this respect forming a striking contrast to the natives of the Spanish republics. Neither, again, is there to be found in the free mulatto or negro of Brazil that insolence and those other most objectionable qualities that so distinguish the mulattoes and negroes of the United States, the West Indies, and other Anglo-Saxon countries, wherein slavery has been an institution. The reason is not far to seek. Black blood is a reproach in the latter. The Anglo-Saxon will not marry with the Negro, as does the Latin, and more especially the Portuguese colonist. He hates and despises the son of Ham, and all who have the slightest taint of African blood. The mulatto knows this, feels it deeply, despises himself that he is of a despised race. Though feigning to imagine himself a man and a brother, he is aware that he is a social outcast, that the whites will not eat with him or associate with him. So he revenges himself by insolence and brutality, feeling that it is vain for him to be ambitious, that he can never rise. He gnaws his heart out with distorted aspirations and crushed vanity. But in Brazil, this caste feeling does not exist at all, or at any rate to a very slight extent. The best families have Negro blood in their veins. The pure whites are an insignificant minority, and the mulatto, taking a pride in himself, feeling himself to be really on an equality with the other citizens in every respect, falls into his natural position, and has no need, like the Barbadian Negro, that worst of his species, to try and pass off his inferiority by unbounded insolence to those of the superior race. However, May the day be very far off when the Anglo-Saxon, like the Portuguese, feels no degradation in allying himself with the African. For the Negro, though he may be a man, is certainly not a brother, whatever his white friends may say. We sailed from Wagaripe at daybreak on the following morning, and tacked down on the top of the ebb tide until we reached the center of the broad stretch of water within the Barra Falsa, or false interest to the Reconcavo which, obstructed with reefs as it is, has caused the destruction of many a vessel that had mistaken it for the true passage. Suddenly, we ran hard upon a sandbank and stuck fast. The unfortunate pilot, who had been confident as usual, now burst into tears and rushed up and down the deck, stamping and raving. On being sternly asked for an explanation of his conduct, he jerked out between his sobs, Ah, senor, it is not my fault indeed. It is the mermaids. The mermaids, thou idiot? Yes, senor, there never was a bank here before. I have sailed ten thousand times across here, but the last time, yes, close here indeed, just here, I saw a mermaid. I did not throw her a gift, and thus she has revenged herself. Ah, dear, ah, dear, what a miserable wrench am I. We could, of course, abuse him no more after so satisfactory an exculpation of himself. A pilot cannot in justice be held responsible for the acts of a malicious mermaid who piles sandbanks in his course. Had we known the Reconcavo was infested by these dangerous maidens, I should not have ventured to navigate its waters in my precious falcon. All the fishermen of this coast have an unshakable faith in mermaids. Few among them are there that have not at least once seen one of these beautiful water people. It is customary to place mirrors and combs on rocks by the sea as propitiatory gifts to them. As the tide was still ebbing, we had to reconcile ourselves to a few hours' stay on the mermaid bank, so I rode off with my friends to the coast about a mile and a half distant, where we perceived some houses. After landing on the sandy beach at the mouth of a small river, we walked up to the village, the polite, kind yellow people of which informed us that it was called by the curious name of Caja de Pregos, or Box of Nails. 
The houses, or rather bamboo huts, are not built in streets, but scattered through a dense and pleasant grove of bananas, cocos, mangoes, breadfruit trees, and the like, winding footpaths connecting one with the other in such a way that the settlement is a very Hampton Court maze. The whale bones that occasionally form the doorposts of these huts indicate the occupation of the people. We at last, after much wandering in the maze, came to a little bamboo public house where passable cachaça or white rum was vended. Over the bar were pasted two plates cut out of a Portuguese illustrated paper. One was the portrait of Mr. Gladstone. The pendant was Henri Rochefort. We came across an old mulatto boatman here who undertook to paddle off to the Falcon at high tide and pilot us across the banks. After being introduced to and then cordially welcomed by every man, woman, or child, we left the village of the Box of Nails and rowed back to the Falcon. At 4 p.m. the tide had risen two feet and we were again afloat. Then our new pilot came off to us in his dugout. A long discussion ensued between him and the old pilot, for the former insisted that the bank on which we had grounded had existed where it now was for twenty years, to his knowledge. This rather shook our faith in the mermaid story, and we led our unfortunate Portuguese, who was now getting rather sick of the falcon, to understand that we would throw him overboard if he played the fool with us any more, mermaids or no mermaids. Our mulatto piloted us over the shoals and then left us when we proceeded without further accident to the whaling village of Sawamaro de Catu, off which we anchored for the night. Of course, there was a fiesta, church bells, fireworks, and dancing, at which, being welcome, we assisted. The next day we sailed to Bahia. First we had to beat down a rather narrow channel. However, the pilot, though sad, was confident, said he, there are no more sandbanks now. There are only a few rocks ahead. Sandbanks may change their position. Rocks cannot. But a mermaid can move even rocks. On hearing this, all the poor fellow's confidence vanished and a terrible anxiety to be easily read on his face took its place. We too felt anxious, for after so many specimens of his ignorance, we doubted his accurate knowledge of the position of the rocks. For our part, he being the pilot, we preferred sandbanks. However, all went well. We sailed down the river with its beautiful banks, passed Itaparica again, crossed the broad Reconcava studded with quaint native craft, and before night we were at anchor once more under Fort Lamar. The pleasant trip was over. The temperature, by the way, during this voyage ranged from 88 degrees to 94 degrees in our cabin. I stayed in Bahia for another 36 hours and then sailed for the north. It puzzled me somewhat to decide what should be my next port of call on my way to the West Indies. Having seen the principal and most beautiful of Brazilian cities, I did not care to call at any other ports of this empire. Besides which, I wanted to make a lengthy sea voyage of it now in order to blow some of the malaria out of myself. Thus, I determined to sail direct for distant Guinea, but the question was whether to make for a harbor of Dutch, French, or English Guinea. Cayenne, being one of the most remarkable penal settlements in the world, rather excited my curiosity. Having no charts or pilot directories for the coast of the north of Brazil, I hunted all over Bahia in search of these. It was in vain. There was nothing of the kind to be found here. This was awkward for I knew that all the coasts north of the Amazon is so obstructed with mud banks far out to sea that charts and good ones, too, are quite indispensable for a skipper wishing to make any of the harbors, especially if the skipper be an amateur one, like myself. However, I found among the captains who loafed about the ship chandlers an old German, master of a bark loading here with sugar for Hamburg. He knew Demerara well, and gave me such plain directions for making the mouth of that river that I made up my mind to sail for Georgetown, the capital of British Guinea. The directions of my friendly skipper were as follows. Get hold of the coast near Berbice, and sail on four fathom soundings till you sight the lighthouse and fort at the mouth of the Demerara River. When they bear south-southwest, sail straight in without fear. 
for a vessel of the falcon's draft these directions are all that is wanted but they would hardly do for a much larger craft from bahia to georgetown is about two thousand six hundred english miles so this was to be one of our long voyages on the thirteenth of january having taken our water on board and a supply of stores we got under way the afternoon breeze enabling us soon to get outside the bay among the heaving atlantic waves our old enemy the northerly monsoon was still blowing but not so boisterously as is his fashion further south for the first six hundred miles of the voyage that is to near cape saint roque i decided to keep hold of the land taking short tacks not only that we might enjoy the scenery but with the object of fishing for outside the inner reef of the Recife there extends for a thousand miles or more along this coast, and parallel to it, a submerged reef of coral, known as the Prasail, one of the finest fishing grounds for rockfish in the world. We found it so, as we now tacked backwards and forwards across it for a week, securing bonitos, rock cod, kingfish, dolphins, swordfish, and a dozen other species with whose English names I am unacquainted in large quantities the weather was fine though the sea was choppy and sometimes high so we enjoyed these seven days for the monotony of an ocean voyage is much relieved by being as we were ever in sight of a varying and beautiful coast we passed the great cocals village after village of negro fishermen with whom as they came out to us in their strange boats we often conversed we saw Sergipe, gave Cape Coruripe and the neighboring reefs of San Rodrigo a wide berth, and took a board up to the mouth of the mighty Rio San Francisco, a river 1,800 miles in length, the most valuable watercourse in Brazil, and along whose banks dwell one-sixth of the population of the empire. On the 17th of January, we came to where forest-clad heights fell abruptly in cliffs of red rock into the ocean, and behind them the far purple peaks of the inland Serra Barriga rose into the pale blue sky. On the 18th of January, the coast changed once more, being gently undulating and covered with groves of fruit trees unplanted by man. This day we passed the bay of Alagoas and Masaio, and at night sailed along a coast lit up for leagues by a great forest fire. On the 20th of January, we doubled Cape San Augustino, and soon after discerned the hill of Olinda with its many churches and convents, and the great flat city of Pernambuco. A very bright idea now struck me. I had been rather troubled about my foul bill of health, and I feared quarantine in Demerara. Now, if I put into Pernambuco, where yellow fever had not yet broken out, I might get a clean bill for Demerara. It was worth trying. The Pernambucan authorities, I knew, would not quarantine me, though yellow fever had got under way at Bahia. The Brazilians don't mind Yellow Jack. They are too familiar with him. Besides, he does not attack a native often, but only sweeps off the foreign sailors and such like strangers. Had it been smallpox now that had been written across my bill of health, I should certainly have been quarantined, for the Brazilian dreads that disease indeed, and rightly, for it commits fearful ravages among the South American populations. So it was that, to the dismay of my mate, I put into Pernambuco after all. He took precious good care, by the way, not to go on shore during our stay. Refusing the services of a pilot, I took the vessel through the Picao or Little Passage, the narrow entrance I have described as under the old Dutch fort on the Recife, and brought up within the great breakwater nearly opposite to my old hotel. Several mail steamers were anchored without, while within the Recife I recognized to my surprise and joy the Norseman telegraph ship, which, as my readers will remember, towed us into Maldonado just a year back. I succeeded in getting a clean bill of health for Demerara on the morrow after my arrival, and passed the remainder of the day with my old friends of the Norsemen. While I was on shore, a mutiny broke out on the Falcon. Giobata Panisa refused to obey the mate, 
drew his knife on him and compelled him to beat a precipitate retreat into the cabin where the mate finding a loaded revolver in his turn forced the other to retire up the companion to the main deck at this stage of the proceedings i arrived on board and after settling matters very quickly pitched into the mate roundly for his impotence in preserving discipline when i was away explaining to him that it was his duty at once hit on the head with the weightiest bit of iron handy any one who ventured to question his commands as for panisa i got hold of him by the collar informed him that it was my unalterable intention to throw him overboard whether we were in port or mid-ocean on the very next occasion he even talked of using his knife having thus restored peace to the vessel i looked around and found them a lot of hard work to do so as to keep them quiet for the rest of the day on the following day the twenty second of january having taken on board an abundant stock of bananas pineapples yams sweet potatoes and manioca we sailed out of the harbor this time by the larger olinda passage it is two thousand miles from pernambuco to the mouth of the demerary the voyage occupied us exactly ten days so this is the best log the falcon can show and indeed i do not think it would be easy to find another yacht of her tonnage that had ever kept up a rate of two hundred miles a day for ten consecutive days our best day's work was two hundred and twenty nautical or two hundred and fifty three english miles there were two causes that conduced to this rapid run in the first place we had done with the northerly monsoon for about here are its limits and we sailed away from pernambuco before a fresh southeast wind which enabled us to run for days under all canvas spinnaker included we encountered no calms on crossing the line but passed straight from the southeast to the northeast trade winds which in their turn were favorable to us being on our beam in the second place we had a strong favorable current with us from cape san roque to demerara it is on cape roque the easternmost extremity of the new world from which the coasts fall away at right angles the one to the other that the great ocean current from the cape of good hope striking bifurcates one stream flowing down the coast of south america to the southwest known as the brazilian current which allied to the northerly monsoon had troubled us ever since we left the plate and the other stream flowing up the coast of south america to the northwest this is known as the main equatorial current further on after it has crossed the caribbean sea and the gulf of mexico receiving the to us more familiar appellation of the gulf stream this equatorial current is of great assistance to vessels proceeding up the coast from the cape san roque the rate of it varies according to the season of the year sometimes it is said flowing as rapidly as four knots an hour the greatest difference we observed between our distance run in twenty-four hours as recorded by log and observation was fifty miles which would give a two-knot current for the first six days of the voyage the wind blew fresh from the southeast enabling us to make about seven to eight knots an hour through the water this brought us to the equator when the wind veered rapidly around to the northeast and so continued till we reached demerara we did not encounter any calm whatsoever indeed the lowest rate logged for any hour of the voyage was five and a half knots for the first few days we hugged the coast saw the port of parahiba and passed close to the rocas those perilous reefs that lie off cape san roque and which are so dreaded by mariners but now a lighthouse is being constructed on one of the higher rocks we could perceive the men working on it as we sailed by during this portion of the voyage we passed many jagandas the clumsy native coasters they sail well but do not appear to be built for really bad weather but bad weather is of rare occurrence on this tropical ocean i suppose when a jaganda is caught by a gale outside it goes down after doubling Cape San Roque, we left the land and took a course more to seawards so as to avoid the variable inshore currents and to fall in with the main body of the equatorial current. When we were off San Luis do Marano, we had an offing of about 200 miles, which we kept till we approached Guinea. 
We caught a great many fish during this run, especially dolphins of large size. It was indeed pleasant, though rather monotonous sailing. As the wind and current were in the same direction, the sea was remarkably smooth, rolling about in long, oily-looking waves of tepid water under a blazing sun. The temperature in our cabin was high, 85 degrees to 90 degrees. We crossed the equator on the 26th of January in longitude 42 degrees 28 minutes. On the 28th of January, we were off the mouths of the Amazon, but too far out to sea to find ourselves in the discolored water that this huge river pours out into the ocean. Now that we had a northeast wind and a beam sea, high and choppy at times, our motion was not so comfortable as it had been for the first six days of the voyage. We rolled heavily, took much water on board, and on several occasions were under two-reefed mainsail. On the 29th of January, being off the north frontier of Brazil and Cayenne bearing west of us 170 miles, we steered so as to approach the coast once more. This day we came into a very heavy sea, with nasty waves breaking and curling up against the rapid current. With us, the wind was not strong, but a gale must have been blowing somewhere. We had now sailed into a very different climate from that which prevails on the healthy coasts of Brazil. The sky, instead of being clear, was ever overcast. An unhealthy yellow haze hung upon the sea by night, and the atmosphere was oppressively close. I have since read a work by a naval officer who observes how debilitating an effect is produced by this great heat accompanied by moisture. He states he often had half his men below on the sick list while sailing off the coast of the Guineas. The crew of the Falcon, who seems to have got into a generally bad state of health, felt these influences and were suffering from fever and those bilious and intestinal disorders that are common in these latitudes. On the 31st of January, having obtained no observation of the sun for two days in consequence of the heavy vapors, but knowing that the land could not be far off, we hove to at daybreak to take soundings, but found no bottom in forty fathoms. This day we contrived to get the meridian altitude and an observation of the sun for longitude at 4 p.m. We discovered that we were but 20 miles to the north of the river Surinam in Dutch Guinea. On taking a cast of the lead, we found that we were in 12 fathoms. The water here was a dirty soup color, as it is far out to sea all along this coast. End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of the Cruise of the Falcon by E. F. Knight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty five Demerara. The coast of Guinea, indeed of all the countries between the Amazons and the Gulf of Paria, a stretch of upwards of a thousand miles, is one of the strangest and most dreary in the world, rich though the inner country may be. For here the silt brought down by many mighty rivers, notably the Amazon and Orinoco, has formed a broad strip of low alluvial land that extends far out seawards from the forest-clad hills. It is difficult to distinguish where these vast plains terminate, and the sea begins, for the slope is so gradual that the mariner can find soundings when yet a day's sail from the coast, and a vessel can drive ashore and be broken up by the heavy rollers on the shoals though from the masthead no land be visible. And to mariners thus wrecked, poor is the prospect of escape in the boats, for if they are not swamped by the breakers and reach smoother water, they can go on for long leagues, but the sea very gradually shallowing till there be but a few feet of water under them, and going further they will find vegetation indeed, but not land, for dense groves of mangroves grow out into the sea and in places forests of huge trees. And now the boat can go no further, nor can the men proceed on foot, for the mud underneath is soft as butter and deep, so that one venturing on it will sink wholly in it. Indeed, it appears a hopeless land of slime and fever, quite unfitted for man, unless it be for the tree Indians, a low race of fish-eating savages that, like birds, 
build their homes among the branches of the flooded forests on the Gulf of Paria. But within this outlying waste of mud, there lies one of the most fertile countries of the world. If one ascends any of the creeks or rivers that pierce the outer swamps and afford the sole means of communication to the interior, he will find himself among the richest plains of earth where are cultivated sugar, cocoa, and all tropical produce while further inland are mountains and valleys covered with one dense primeval forest of the rarest cabinet woods but this latter yet unexplored is inhabited only by indian tribes cannibals some of them for the settlements of the few white men are solely on the very unhealthy but fertile low-lying coast region chiefly at the mouths of the rivers at midday january the thirty first we were as i have said about twenty miles from the nearest land near the river Suriname. The lightship that lies off the mouth of the Berbice River, and which is moored about 12 miles out to sea, was now but 130 miles distant, and for this I now shaped a direct course. As I had no chart, and knew not how far out to sea the tongues of the shoals might extend, I took casts of the lead at frequent intervals. So soft is the bottom hereabouts that it is difficult to feel when the lead reaches it, and about a foot must be deducted from the depth indicated to allow for the sinking into the mud. A fresh east-northeast wind, driving us on at the rate of seven knots an hour, blew during the night, yet a heavy haze lay on the ocean. The soundings decreased as we advanced till at 3 a.m. we found but three fathoms of water, so we hauled two points to windward and got into the line of five fathom soundings. We were then off the mouth of the great Corentin River that divides British from Dutch Guinea. At 6 a.m. the soundings quite suddenly fell to three fathoms, and we found ourselves in the midst of very heavy and dangerous rollers. These were so high and steep that we had at once to haul our wind and make for deeper water. For upwards of ten minutes we were in real peril of foundering. A heavy-laden merchant vessel would certainly have gone down. As we crossed these waves, our motion was so extremely violent that I fully expected to see the mast chucked right over the bows at any moment. Each sea washed over us, filling our decks with water. I was in charge of the deck at that time. The tremendous jerks, the noise, and the alarming angles the vessel assumed, sometimes seeming to stand almost on end, brought up the watch below, who fully expected to find that we had driven on shore among the breakers and were fast tumbling to pieces but the falcon behaved admirably as usual, and after steering seaward for a quarter of an hour, we reached the six fathom soundings and were in comparatively smooth water again. I learnt afterwards at Georgetown that the rollers, which breaking more or less heavily, are always to be met with on this shoal, are a well-known danger to the mariners of this coast, and that many a vessel had not come out of them to tell the tale as we did, but has gone down with all hands. At 9 a.m. we passed close to the Berbice lightship and perceived on our port hand land once more, and what is more, English land, the first that I had seen since I had sailed out of Falmouth Harbor. We coasted along the shore in four fathom soundings, the sea being quite smooth and of a reddish tint. The shore here does not present so desolate an appearance from the seas as it does to the east or west of the British colony. We saw a long, low line of forest, above which at intervals rose the lofty chimneys of the sugar factories. We passed many of the colony craft, shallow but fast, sloops and schooners, very different in build to the coasters of Brazil that we had hitherto seen. In the afternoon we sighted the lighthouse and the shipping at the mouth of the Demerara River. Following the instructions of my friend, the German skipper, I sailed on till these bore south-southwest and then made straight for the entrance to the river, finding nowhere water less than three fathoms. At 4 p.m. we were within the Demerara and dropped our anchor off the fort. The captain of the port soon came off to us, gave us practique, and kindly piloted us to a convenient berth just in front of Georgetown Marketplace, near the landing stage of the steam ferry that affords communication between one side of the river and the other. Having stowed our canvas, we now looked around us. The town that stretched in front of us on the right bank of the river was certainly quite unlike any city I had yet seen in tropical America, in every respect. At a glance, one could perceive that this was a British, not a Spanish or Portuguese, settlement. 
None of the massive, quaint old houses of stone here, none of the irregular streets as of Bahia, the dirt and careless and tidiness, but brand new, unhandsome, but very practical and comfortable buildings of wood and corrugated iron sheets, cleanliness and order. What chiefly puzzled my crew was that all the Negroes that passed us in canoes and rafts spoke English to each other. It was evidently quite a new idea to my Italians, who imagined that all blacks spoke Portuguese alone. I must confess I felt somewhat as they did. It hardly seemed natural to me when I went on shore to hear my native tongue spoken by everyone around me, black, yellow, or white, and I was constantly addressing people at first in Portuguese and Spanish. On the morrow, after my arrival in port, I landed on the stelling by the market and proceeded to inspect the town. The clean, tidy dress of the black and creole policemen, the Zawabi uniform of the soldiers, forcibly brought to my mind that I was no longer in a foreign colony. The streets of Georgetown are wide and regular, the houses are of wood with corrugated iron roofs, and all are erected on piles, standing as it were on stilts. Thus, the ground floor, to explain myself by a bull, is some fourteen feet above the ground. The object of this style of architecture is to avoid the malaria that floats along the surface of the soil. It has been found in all these countries that if the dwelling rooms be thus raised some feet from the ground, the miasma is wholly avoided, or nearly so. In many parts of the north coast of South America, especially on the Spanish main, to sleep one night on the surface of the soil is nearly always fatal, so deadly are the malarious emanations. What constitutes the great charm of Georgetown is that the glorious vegetation of the country has not been excluded from it, but grows in luxuriance between the houses. Viewed from the summit of the lighthouse, Georgetown presents not the appearance of a city, but of a lovely grove of tall palms and many flower-covered trees and bushes, with habitations scattered through it. The residential houses are built in the comfortable East Indian style, with verandas surrounding them. Each stands in its own garden. There are streets in Georgetown that are more like botanical gardens than streets, to which the tropical hothouses of Kew are very deserts. There is one very broad street at the back of Government House, the name of which I forgot. The excellent Georgetown Club, of which I was an honorary member during my stay, is in it. And of it, Georgetown should be proud. Along both sides of it are villas and wonderful gardens. In its center, between shady avenues of trees, flows a sluggish canal, entirely covered with the magnificent Victoria Regia lilies. There is a botanical garden outside Georgetown, but the skill of man cannot outdo the splendors of the vegetation that will spring up anywhere in this land where allowed to do so. The population of Georgetown is indeed cosmopolitan, for four continents are here abundantly represented. The Europeans are, of course, much in the minority. Of these, the Portuguese are the most numerous. The small tradesmen and artificer class being largely made up of these frugal people. The Englishmen here are among the most agreeable and hospitable of their race. It was here I began to learn what was meant by West Indian hospitality. After the hospitality of my countrymen in this colony, the next thing that the stranger observes is their hats. I do not think any town presents the spectacle of so varied a collection of headgear. You could not wear anything that would be considered eccentric at Georgetown in the way of hats. Of course, first there are the pith helmets of every kind, straw hats of infinite breadth of brim, but it is, after all, in white felt hats that the inhabitants show their ingenuity most. And high above them all towers the stupendous pyramid that graces the head of a certain popular and respected crown officer. After the white, nankeen jacketed, much hatted Britisher come the representatives of Africa, the descendants of the black slaves, here a very worthless and vicious class. America is represented by nearly naked, stunted red Indians who come down the river in their canoes from the interior to barter bows and arrows skins of wild beasts and other curiosities in the capital, and get dead drunk with the proceeds. Then we have the Asiatic coolies, who are as numerous as the blacks. First, the inscrutable Chinese, who have their own quarter, 
and more frugal than even the Portuguese are gradually cutting out the latter as small tradesmen. Then the Hindus, nude save for the scanty loincloth, slim of limb, and though of the lowest castes, beautiful and with high noble heads, sad gentlemen who, quarter-staff in hand, walk softly through the streets, men of an antique civilization who look with contempt on their fellow laborers, the Africans and American Indians, with their heavy animal faces, who never have had and never will have a civilization. So many friends did I have in Georgetown, and so agreeably did time fly, that I extended my stay to a fortnight. The town was fairly healthy while I was there, though there was some yellow fever. A frightful epidemic of this pest of South America had been, till recently, raging in Demerara and in the southern Antilles, but was now dying away. In Georgetown, the fever had proved most fatal to the upper-class white residents and the officers of the garrison, not, as usual, being chiefly prevalent among the shipping in the river in the low quarters of the city. In consequence of this, the white troops had now all been sent home, the Negro regiment alone remaining. So great had been the mortality among the Europeans that the constant dances that so characterized Demereran and West Indian life were now conspicuous by their absence, for all were mourning many friends, if not relations, and a gloom hung over the usually gay and lively population. As a rule, Georgetown is as healthy as any city of tropical America. Everywhere in the neighborhood of Georgetown, the jungle is cleared, and great plantations of sugar wave in the trade wind. The country looks as if it ought to be the most unhealthy in the world, yet it is far from being that. It is but one vast plain of mud, drained by innumerable canals and ditches which afford passages to canoes. It is no wonder that the Dutch seized this colony that, to other peoples, would have appeared the most uninviting portion of all the South American coast, for it must have strongly reminded them of their native land. Demerara is a tropical Holland, as skillfully dammed, canaled, and irrigated as is the European home of its first possessors. Much of this rich land has been conquered from the ocean. Great sea walls of faggots overlaid with stones keep out the water at high tide, which would otherwise then overflow the plantations. At low tide, the gates in this wall are open, so that the pent-in waters from the canals and drains find exit to the sea. Sometimes, after a spring tide, the soft mud accumulates in banks outside these dikes, and, being higher than the level of the reclaimed land, prevents this outdrainage. Then very regiments of coolies have to dig channels through the vast slimy mess, a seemingly Herculean task, till the imprisoned waters of the estates are released. There is no genuine terra firma in this colony, that is, in the cultivated coast regions. The dry earth forms but a thin crust over practically bottomless mud. Hence, it has been found very difficult to erect really heavy buildings. They are certain to gradually sink. When the heavy machinery of the sugar factories was first introduced, great difficulties in this respect were experienced. As there is no stone in the neighborhood of Georgetown, the few roads are paved in an ingenious manner. First, brushwood is laid down on the road and fired. The mud that is dug out of the canals or ditches that border every thoroughfare here is then piled on the blazing pile. The fire bakes this into a very hard red brick-like substance, which, broken up, makes very fair macadam. Having obtained the necessary permission to land there, I started one morning to visit the penal settlement on the Mazaruni River. The little passenger steamer that ascends the Esquibo calls at this settlement, accomplishing the voyage in about six hours. We steamed along the muddy, shallow water till we came to the broad mouth of the Esquibo and entered the river by one of the channels between the many islands that encumber this estuary. Great shallow islands, these, formed of the alluvial matter brought down from the interior, and all covered with a dense vegetation. One of these, the Dauntless Bank, has been but recently formed, having grown round the wreck of a vessel of the same name. This nucleus was sufficient to collect in a few years an immense mass of mud and sand, and there is now quite a large island covered with lofty vegetation. 
I visited it later on with some friends in a schooner, having been promised considerable sport. But, save for shooting some scarlet ibis and catching some small mullet with a seine net, after wading all day up to our waists in poisonous mud, we did nothing. The low banks of the Esquibo are covered with a rank vegetation, but through the openings formed by the creeks are to be seen glimpses of the plantations of sugar cane that lie behind. After passing a small island, on which stood the ruins of an old Dutch fort, the scenery became more picturesque. The banks were higher and clothed with forest, and rocky islets rose above the water, showing that we were now so far in the interior of the country as to have reached genuine terra firma once again, and had passed the belt of bottomless mud. We steamed by a long island, which I observed was unlike the others, inhabited. There were many huts on it, cattle and cultivated patches of cassava and plantains. This was, I was informed, Cow Island, the leper island of the colony. All who are affected with this fearful disease are sent here. There are no boats on the island, as the lepers are not allowed to leave it on any pretense. Soon after passing this, we came to where the three rivers Esequibo, Mazaruni, and Cuyuni join. It is here, on a bluff some hundred feet high, sloping down to the first-named river, a most picturesque position, that the penal settlement is established. I was well piloted over this establishment, for my friend, Captain Fortescue, the inspector of prisons for the colony, luckily happened to have come up on the steamer with me. Landing with him, I was introduced to the governor, with whom I stayed until the steamer started back for Georgetown on the morrow. This is, indeed, a model penal settlement. If any fault can be found with it, it is that the most healthy, beautiful, and in every respect most desirable spot of the colonized portion of British Guinea has been selected as a residence of malefactors. Here, at an elevation sufficient to be almost entirely free from the malaria, the buildings connected with the settlement are scattered over an undulating expanse of lawn and garden, backed behind by a primeval forest that extends to Venezuela. These buildings have a singularly cheerful and unprison-like appearance. All have been constructed by the labor of the convicts. Indeed, this penal colony is, I believe, entirely independent of the outer world for all its necessities. The prisoners grow their own sugar canes and make their own sugar. They cultivate an extensive provision ground, breed cattle and sheep, work in the nice quarries where comes the only stone used in muddy Demerara, and are employed in a dozen other industries at least. The convicts are nearly all Chinese, East Indian coolies, and blacks. Of Europeans, there are not many. There were but two Englishmen among them when I was there, but generally there are to be found a few Frenchmen. These are runaway convicts from the French penal colony of Cayenne. They manage to steal boats occasionally and to escape, a dozen or so at a time, to British Guinea. As they are, for the most part, regular mauvais sujets, they generally renew their old games in Demerara, are convicted of some crime, and packed off to Mazaruni. The Hindu coolies give the prison authorities much trouble, for, when condemned to penal servitude for long terms of years, they are much given to committing suicide. Notwithstanding every precaution, instances of this are of frequent occurrence. They proceed to a happy despatch in a most deliberate manner. Being deprived of knives and any ordinary implements of destruction, they will choke themselves with their loin girdles. Those that are suspected of the suicidal tendency are watched with unceasing vigilance. The cemetery of the settlement is also the flower garden, a lovely spot thickly grown with the most gorgeous plants of the tropic zone. Behind the enclosure of the prison ground stretches, as I have said before, the primeval forest that extends to Venezuela. The black warders entertain a wholesome dread of this unknown waste, for a fixed idea exists among them that an invading Venezuelan army will one day march out of it upon the British colony. It seems that Venezuela did, or does, lay claim to this portion of Guinea, whereas the English lay down the frontier as upwards of a hundred miles to the northwest of this. Venezuelans have been known to issue out of the depths of this forest and make their appearance at the convict settlement, 
but these far from being invaders are unfortunate fugitives who after the collapse of their party in one of the usual revolutionary wars that so adorn the history of all south american republics travel through dense jungle to seek protection on british soil these weary tattered foreigners speaking a strange tongue cause a good deal of unnecessary panic among the blacks when they appear among them but that the poor wretches should be for a moment mistaken for ferocious invaders is indeed curious just as the steamer was starting the next morning i perceived as i stood on the bridge a long canoe come alongside manned by nude aborigines these indians were a better-looking race than i had seen in the chaco and pampas and certainly a far less ferocious countenance their faces wore a fixed expression of apathetic content and mildness of disposition the women were hideous and the copper bodies of the men were ornamented with stripes of black paint several of them came on board to take a passage to georgetown carrying with them bows and arrows cassava crushers skins of birds and the logs of wood with which they poison the rivers and so secure the fish these curiosities they would sell to the Chinese and Portuguese curiosity shopkeepers for a little silver coin, or plenty of bad rum, or maybe for one of those extraordinary guns that are expressly imported for their benefit, like the child's toy gun in appearance and scarcely more use. I believe they are known as buck guns to the trade, not that they are intended to shoot bucks or anything else, but simply to be sold to buck Indians as the male aborigines are politely called by their white rulers. One of these Indians must have been a chieftain, for he owned a pair of nankeen trousers, not being girdled around the loins merely like the others. He did not wear his trousers during the voyage, however, but kept them carefully folded under his arm till we were near Georgetown, when he deliberately, with a gravity and unconsciousness that were delicious, put them on before all the passengers on the main deck, then his followers clustered around him admiringly, felt the texture of the material, and expressed approval in their soft, sleepy-sounding language. I should have much liked to have undertaken an expedition into the interior of Guinea, one of the most grand of tropical countries, though but little known and explored. But the costs of such a trip are heavy unless one has companions to share them. Mr. Barrington Brown's descriptions of the renowned Roraima Mountains and the Kayatir Falls, which latter he himself discovered, are indeed tempting to all who love the wonders of nature. End of chapter 35「Chapter 36 of the Cruise of the Falcon by E. F. Knight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36 Barbados and Home With much reluctance, I tore myself away from my friends of Georgetown and sailed for my next port, Bridgetown, in the island of Barbados, distant about 400 miles. We reached the light ship at about daybreak and there found a very nasty sea running. High, steep rollers were coming in that tossed us about in a very uncomfortable way. The light ship was no less lively. As we passed her, she hoisted three signals to us in succession. J.L. Appearances are threatening. J.P. Heavy weather coming. And J.S. Get an offing. As we knew that those on board had some good reason for thus warning us, we did not disregard their advice, but made for the open sea on the port tack. At 2 p.m., considering that we had now got out a sufficient offing, and would easily weather the outermost shoals off the Essequibo, I put the vessel about and found that she would just lay on her course for Barbados when close-hauled on the starboard tack. The wind north-northeast to northeast had now freshened. The sea was very rough, in consequence doubtlessly of the opposition of the wind and current, which was rushing with great velocity towards the Gulf of Paria. This head sea deadened our way, and we shipped a good deal of water at times. On the following day, the weather was worse. The ship labored a good deal, and our decks were constantly full of water. We were obliged to take two reefs in our mainsail and set the third jib. On the 17th of February, the weather improved, though there was still an unpleasantly choppy sea. 
This day we overhauled one of the island schooners and were pleased to find that we not only sailed much faster than she did, but that she made much more leeway than ourselves. Her mainsail was a huge sliding gunter as is usual in the West Indian schooners and set flat as a board. Indeed, the sailmakers in these islands know their trade well and often cut sails that Lapthorne would not be ashamed of. During the whole of this voyage, I was suffering from a bad attack of remittent bilious fever, which for three days quite prostrated me and prevented me from taking my watch. This fever, common in tropical South America, is very severe while it lasts. Nearly all the symptoms of yellow fever accompany it, including the yellowness. Indeed, it is often mistaken for yellow fever, and many deaths that occur through it on vessels at sea are put down to the more deadly and contagious disorder. My mate, of course, was sure that it was yellow fever from which I was suffering, and was in much dread of contagion. It may have been so, as far as I know, but I rather think that it was not. At midday, the 18th of February, we sighted the island of Barbados. As we approached it, its often remarked likeness to the Isle of Wight, as viewed from the sea, struck me. It is about the same size as the English island, and like it, is covered with verdure. But the verdure of Barbados, when seen nearer, proves to be that of the sugar cane, which is planted over the whole island from the mountain tops to the seashore. We had been sailing all this time on the starboard tack, but now found that we just failed of making our destination without tacking. At about midnight, we were some four miles from the shore, under the lee of the island, between South Point Lighthouse and Needham Point. Tacking off and on, we preserved this position until daylight, when we sailed into Carlisle Bay and came to an anchor off Bridgetown in the man-of-war ground. Bridgetown, seen from the anchorage, does not look like a town at all, but more like a village of huts scattered over a pleasant grove of cabbage palms, cotton trees, and other tropical vegetation. No sooner had our chain run out of the hawse pipes than we were surrounded by a very fleet of negro boots, whose garrulous occupants commenced to swarm over our decks until we drove them off forcibly. Their importunity was fearful. There were fat, bumboat women vending ginger, bananas, and what not. Other damsels who wished to do our washing for us at half a dollar de dozen piece, massa, and others, men, women, and children, who had no ostensible trade, but were adroit beggars and thieves. I had nowhere else experienced so disagreeable an ovation. It would be well if the rigid laws about visiting vessels that prevail in Bahia and other Brazilian ports were enforced in this harbor. But the Barbadian Negro is free a great deal too free to be otherwise than exceedingly objectionable. As I still felt very ill, and it was Sunday, I did not go on shore this day. On Monday, the 20th of February, I landed in my boat in the Caranaga, or inner and artificial harbor. I was surprised to find all the shops shut and to hear the church bells ringing, and, on inquiring the cause of this, was told that this had been proclaimed a holiday and day of thanksgiving throughout the island of Barbados for the cessation of the yellow fever. This curse of the West Indies had been raging in an epidemic form for many months in this island, which is generally free from it, and is indeed considered to be by far the healthiest of all the Antilles. As at Georgetown, the white regiments had been removed. I soon saw that my stay in Barbados would be prolonged, for I had brought several letters of introduction with me, and my friends soon became legion. The hospitality of the Barbadians is well known, and they take very good care that no stranger leaves them but with regret, and bearing away with him a most agreeable memory of the delightful little island. Barbados seemed to me utterly strange after the countries I had recently visited. I felt as if I was in Europe in England once again, for it is not the towns merely here that show signs of civilization, but the whole country. No trackless backwoods and jungles meet the traveler, no indications of a new country and of a struggle between barbarism and civilization. The whole island is as carefully cultivated as the richest portions of Great Britain. Good roads, painfully glaring by the way as they are macadamized with snow-white coral, are everywhere, 
indeed form a closer network than anywhere in england pleasant country houses too are dotted over all the country the habitations of planters each surrounded with its sugar plantations boiling houses and windmill for the windmill is the great feature of a barbadian landscape sugar making is not here carried on on so large a scale as in demerara but by private individuals of small capital hence the use of wind as a rule instead of steam power happily the trade wind blows fresh and strong during the very season of the sugar making indeed on the whole barbados gives one the impression of not being a colony at all but an old settled country it is indeed our most ancient settlement in this portion of the globe having been in our undisputed possession since 1625. So many friends had I that there was no part of the island that I did not visit at the invitation of the hospitable planters, from the petroleum wells on the windward coast to the quaintly shaped hills of the districts known as Scotland at the other extremity. We had some pleasant picnics and cruises, too, in the Falcon, visiting in her the little ports of Whole Town and Spitestown, one day we circumnavigated the island with a party of friends carefully avoiding of course the coral reef that entirely surrounds barbados this voyage we accomplished in eleven hours we passed a vessel that had run ashore on the reefs off south point she was rapidly breaking up and the timber that formed her cargo was scattered floating over the ocean the negroes of the windward coast famous wreckers were hard at work collecting this and no doubt managed to steal a good deal before a body of police was sent down to look after them. My cook now became very ill indeed, and I was obliged to send him to the colonial hospital. His illness promised to be a very tedious one, and I was much puzzled as to what to do next. To sail away without him, the best sailor and the most trustworthy man I had, in fact the only one of the crew worth anything, was a measure which I felt great repugnance in taking. Again, to wait at Bridgetown until he was well enough to resume his duties, which might be a question of many months, was impossible. I frequently visited the poor fellow at the hospital, as he was very lonely there, not being able to express himself in English, and finding no one who understood Spanish or Italian. That we should be obliged to sail away without him evidently preyed on his mind, for he was really attached to me and to the vessel, and nothing could compensate him for a separation. However, other circumstances led me to decide on a course of action which certainly was the remotest from my thoughts when I sailed into Bridgetown. I was recalled to England by important business that could not well wait, and I saw that I must give up my cruise through the West Indian Islands and sail home at once. Things standing thus... Certain of my friends put it before me that it would be well to discharge my crew, lay up the falcon, return to England by steamer, and in the delightful winter season, after the hurricane months were over, come back to the West Indies, refit the yacht, ship a native crew, and carry out my old plan. I doubt whether I should have given way had it not been that several friends offered then to join me for a cruise right through the islands. I had now so long been alone on board that the idea of companions seemed very pleasant. Such a voyage with a merry party of West Indians who knew the islands and would have friends everywhere was indeed something to be looked forward to. My friend, Mr. Taylor of Fontabelle, kindly offered to store my property and look after the yacht while I was away if I hauled her up on the beach by his garden. Thus it was that I determined to lay up the falcon for a time and suspend my cruise for some six months. There were not wanting other reasons to help me in coming to this decision. Among others, the necessity for a thorough overhauling of my vessel and my own rather ill condition of health. My system was soaked with malaria, which weakened me and took away much of my energy and pleasure in the voyage. Seeing the rather unaccountable ill health of all hands on board the yacht, continuing as it had done over a period of some months a suspicion as to a probable cause crossed my mind which has now been much strengthened by an article i recently read in a medical journal our diet while at sea and to a great extent also while in port had consisted in tinned meats now these preserved provisions wholesome though they may be when fresh 
do not, as many suppose, keep so for an indefinite time. Chemical changes of some kind take place in the contents of the tin, while the metal itself, dissolved as it must gradually become by the acids that some provisions contain, is itself more or less injurious. Many of our tins had been two years on board the Falcon, and most of that time in the tropics. In my opinion, this had something to do with the symptoms of blood poisoning that were manifested by several of our company. Had I alone been the sufferer, I should not have attributed my ill health to the tin meats, for malaria was sufficient to account for my condition. But here were these Italians, who had visited no very unhealthy country, had caught no malaria, drank no bad water, prostrated with disorders that decidedly indicated the presence of some poison in the system. It is a question if the old sea diet of salt meat is not more wholesome after all than an exclusive living on these tasty but rather treacherous preserved meats and vegetables. I paid off my crew and found means for them to return to Europe and set out to lay up the falcon. I anchored her off Mr. Taylor's house and took everything out of her. Then, with the aid of some twenty negroes, rollers, strong tackle, and screw jacks, I gradually hauled the old vessel out of the water up the shingle bank to a pretty berth under the shade of waving cabbage palms, cocos, and machineels. I did not return to England by the mail steamer, but in the 500-ton bark Augusta, commanded by my friend Captain Young. After a very pleasant, though rather rough voyage of 30 days, we sighted Hartland Point, a strong southwest gale blowing at the time, then hove to under the lee of Lundy to take the pilot on board and were towed into Bristol docks. After nearly two years' absence, I was indeed glad to step once more on English land and walk through the streets of the dear old western town I knew so well, the fresh, rosy faces of the people seeming very pleasing after the sallow and pallid inhabitants of the tropics. I was unable to go to Barbados in the autumn, as I proposed to resume my cruise, for now I was laid up for many months, suffering from severe sequela of malaria, so the old vessel still lies high and dry under the waving palms, waiting till her master returned to take her from isle to isle of the lovely Caribbean Sea, and across the Atlantic to her moorings off familiar old Southampton, which he is eagerly looking forward to do. But up to now, alas, the doctors insist on keeping apart the falcon and her affectionate owner and captain. The end. End of chapter 36. End of the Cruise of the Falcon by Edward Frederick Knight.